This is Acts chapter 3 from the New King James Version. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Um, I don't know if they had, you know, this hour of prayer, I guess, would require an additional study. Uh, was there only one hour of prayer? Were there multiple hours of prayer? Uh, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, it was the ninth hour, which was when the sun was in the th third quarter of the sky, which is, we typically think, around 3 p.m., three hours after high noon. Um, but I've recently discussed, it's probably not a specific time, but a location of the sun in the sky. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. I did a little bit of research, and I believe the gate that is called Beautiful is the main entrance. at the On the east side of the temple, the temple faced to the east. And the gate that led into the temple itself, not the temple grounds, but the temple itself, I believe, is the gate they called Beautiful. Uh, there's some confusion about that. To ask alms from those who entered the temple. Now, I think this is interesting. Uh, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. Well, I think I misstated that uh, because it makes no sense to for Peter and John to be going into the to the holy place. So uh, that's what was throwing me off. I pulled up a map online uh, and this map I'm looking at now says the beautiful gate would have led into what is called the women's courtyard then you would have to go through the gate of Nicanor before you would get to the priest's courtyard which is before you would get into the holy place of the temple so it had many layers uh, and you know only the Levites could go in to the temple and only the high priest could go in the most holy place once a year um, but the temple grounds itself were at, was actually fairly large compared to the temple itself which uh, to me is the holy place and the most holy place but anyway it was a gate leading in from the east side uh, to get to the temple but it wasn't actually part of the temple that was restricted to only the Levites or the high priest uh, Let's see. And asking, or oh, and verse four, and fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, "Look at us." So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, "Silver and gold I do not have, but I, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk." And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So I find it interesting that, you know. Even Peter and John, um, some of the most prominent Christians, they were not wealthy people. So the things that they could provide and could give was not money. And I know today I get the sense that churches primarily are concerned about how much money you can give. Uh, and if you want to provide some other service, I don't know, that's a little cynical. Uh, they like volunteers and people that will help make their services uh, go over without a hitch. You know, they like that too. But there is certainly a tendency to care more about money or care too much about money anyway. But Peter and John give this man something that's more valuable than money. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. No, that means like the temple grounds, not the restricted area only for the Levites. Uh, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. So note, this man who was healed didn't praise John and Peter. He praised God because John and Peter knew where to place the glory. And they said, and they're going to explain it in a minute. But and it's very important that we also never lose sight of where the glory uh, is due and that's for everything including our faith and any good knowledge or wisdom that we have god is the one who opens your mind and gives you this knowledge uh, then they knew 
that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So you can also look, I guess that would be on the south side. If you enter the temple grounds from the east, then you would turn left and walk all the way through the Gentiles' courtyard uh, and find Solomon's porch. It was essentially surrounded uh, on the outer walls by this covered porch all on all four walls. Uh, and I think on the south side would be the area where you have Solomon's porch. It's just a covered area in the temple grounds uh, with a lot of columns. So you could walk around freely in there. Even the Gentiles could go in there. Uh, where did we get to? Verse 12. So then Peter saw it. He responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? So people have a tendency to give too much credit to man. They say, oh, wow, you guys are amazing. You did this. Paul or Peter and John say, why are you looking at us as though we did it? And we need to have that same attitude concerning our faith even. Why do you marvel at any man's faith as if that man is responsible for his faith? God is the one who blesses with the gift of faith. Uh, even when things were hard, and Jesus said, forgive a man 70 times, seven times, the apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. So we get the measure of faith that God gives, and God can give us more, or he can hold it back. Hmm. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go, when Pilate was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, which was Jesus, whom God had raised, whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So that's a long answer from Peter and John to say, this Jesus whom you killed is the one who healed this man and he is also, it says, yes, the faith which comes through him. Uh, I would say it makes more sense to say the faith which comes from him. Uh, it's also through him. You have faith in Jesus of who he said he was and who he is. Uh, but it's not just that, but it's also the faith that he gives you. The faith which comes from him uh, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So Peter and John are quick to recognize who deserves the glory. It's not them. Uh, the power didn't come from them. The power came from God. We also need to recognize in like manner that our faith does not come from us, but it comes from God. And God's the one who deserves praise for our faith, whatever level of faith we have. I think that's important. I know I keep saying it over and over. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. You killed Jesus in ignorance, as did also your rulers, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. So he's talking about Jesus coming back already. Uh, he's talking about the times of refreshing that come from those who repent and be converted. Uh, this was also a time of persecution of Christians. So, you know, I don't think he's simply saying from a physical standpoint, if you become a Christian, you're not going to suffer persecution because we know that Christians did. Uh, but the time of refreshing, the peace that passes understanding, 
is not an earthly physical peace because who knows what's going to happen on earth. It is a peace that you have where you can walk with God and you can have absolute assurance of eternal life with God in the presence of God no matter what happens, whether you live to 100 years old or die at 25 uh, or 10. You can have absolute faith and peace and comfort and time of refreshing when you have that peace within yourself of absolute confidence and faith in Jesus and eternal reward. So that says, verse 20, that he may send Jesus back. That's the second coming, which I'm uh, increasingly convinced that he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, the vindication of the martyrs, uh, the stamp of approval on Christianity and the removal of the Jewish uh, element on earth. So until the times of restoration of all things. Now I know a lot of people would think that that means something that has not happened yet, something way off in our future, or maybe they think it's imminent to our future. Uh, but I believe Peter and John were speaking uh, to their audience and what they said was relevant to their audience. Uh, so the restoration of all things was probably also something in the first century. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So <laughs> that also seems like a reference to AD 70. So whoever, all the unbelievers of Jesus would be utterly destroyed from among the people. It's not talking about, this is not a spiritual destruction. Uh, this is talking about kicking people out of from among the people so those who rejected Jesus those who crucified Jesus and did not repent would be utterly destroyed from among the people those Jews would be eliminated and that's what happened in 70 AD yes and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days so you can look whenever you study the Old Testament Whenever you study the prophets of the Old Testament, you can know that what they prophesy about is the, the focal point of all human history is the death of Jesus, the burial and resurrection uh, in the first century. All the prophets were concerned about that one focal point. They were not focused on uh, our future life on earth past 2019. A.D. Um, or C.E. What most people like to call it. I think, really, I think they do C.E. because they don't want to uh, include any Anno Domini, which I think says in the year of our Lord. So they were trying to get Jesus out of uh, the calculation of time or the representation of time. But anyway, all the prophets of all time from the Old Covenant uh, were talking about these days. which is talking about first century days, which is talking about when Jesus was killed, crucified, and resurrected, uh, and when the Jews were utterly wiped out and destroyed from among the people. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So this is another interesting phrase when we find out, you know, if you turn away from your iniquities, how do you do that? How do you repent? How do you have the ability to repent or opportunity to repent unless God makes that opportunity available? Read it again. To you first, to you Jews who are listening to me who crucified Jesus and I'm telling you to repent. God raised up Jesus and sent him to bless you. And in what way would he bless you? By turning away every one of you from your iniquities. 
So if you turn from your iniquities, can you take credit for turning from iniquities? You say, oh, I'm so glad I repented of my sins. I'm so glad I turned away from my iniquities. You can't say that. What you need to say is, I'm so thankful that Jesus blessed me by turning me away from my iniquities. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus turned you away. Now, people have a problem with that because they say, well, why don't Jesus turn everybody away from their iniquities? Why does he turn this one but not that one? Uh, and I think the biblical response is, who are you to question God? God does what he wants, when he wants, with whomever he wants, however he wants. And he's perfectly justified in doing that because he is the creator, sustainer of life. He has a, a will to accomplish and he uses he creates some vessels of honor and some vessels for dishonor for the purpose of demonstrating wrath versus demonstrating mercy. So don't question God, just accept it. God is sovereign. He does whatever he wants with whomever he wants, however he wants, and he's justified in doing it. Okay, that completes Acts chapter 3.